How's it going everybody? Today I wanted to talk about the Nagant Revolver. Now this was a Russian service revolver used pre-World War I, World War I, and all the way through World War II. Although in World War II they were switching over to other uh, pistols, this was one of the most common because it was easily manufactured. This is a very interesting pistol. To those of you who don't know, the most interesting thing about it is that the cylinder moves forward to make a gas seal with the barrel. Now it requires a special type of ammunition, which we'll get into later, which is 7.62 by 3.8 Nagant in order to make that happen. Uh, the brass actually expands partially in the chamber and the um, sorry, forcing cone here uh, to make a seal. Um, but that allows you to suppress this revolver. It's one of the few revolvers on the planet that you can do that with, which makes this a very interesting revolver, both historically and mechanically. However, I found that there are many kind of myths and misunderstandings about this revolver, and I don't think people get as much enjoyment out of this revolver as they could, simply because the ammo is not available, so we'll go a little bit into reloading as well. Uh, but let's just get into the history of this and a couple of the myths about this revolver. So let's first get into the history of the M95 Nagant. It's named after the year it was designed. And there is kind of a misunderstanding about this revolver, but not just this revolver, but pretty much Russian arms manufacturing and design in general. Everyone says that Russian arms are really simple and rugged and very good designs because of that, especially for trench warfare, and that's all true. Except the Russians did not design these guns. This was actually designed by, let me get the names right because I'm not Belgian, I'm not French, so this, uh, it was designed in Liège, Belgium, which is also where FN is, um, is located, by Leon Nagant. He was a Belgian designer and this gun is not Russian. It was actually originally being produced in uh, Belgium for the Russians. The Tula factory eventually took over and I believe it was uh, 1898 uh, in order to start production for uh, the Russians. But it was originally produced in Belgium for the Russians. And this is not uncommon. Now, this was true for basically all of Russian arms production. It was either designed outside the country or completely manufactured outside the country. It's just that the Russians did not have the firearms designers or the manufacturing capabilities to produce high quality weapons at the time, all the way up to about World War II. Uh, most of their weapons were designed out of the country. They just couldn't do it themselves. Many of the designs we think of as rugged Russian designs were actually rugged Belgium designs. So this goes all the way back to uh, about the Crimean War. You can really see this, that the Russians were lacking in firearms technology. They were taking flintlock muskets up against rifled muskets of the British Empire and the French, and they were getting slaughtered. Most of their guns had to come from outside the country because they could not produce them in uh, in-house. Now, even their Berdan rifle that they used against the Turks was actually designed by an American. Their Smith & Wesson Model 3 revolvers that they had before the Nagant uh, were actually all produced in America by Smith & Wesson. If you go to the actual uh, Mosin Nagant rifle, it was partially designed by a Russian, I believe he was a um, colonel? and partially designed by Nagant, same Nagant we were talking about before with the revolver. Uh, Nagant actually sued later because they basically took, mo well, not most, but parts of his design and incorporated, incorporated it into his new rifle. Um, and the Tolkarev pistol that replaced this is actually a copy, not an exact copy, but damn near, of the Browning FN 1903 pistol, which they were actually already using in their um, army. But the point is, this is not a Russian design. It was designed in Belgium. And people make that mistake quite a bit in saying that this was a Russian design that was made hardy for the trenches. It wasn't. This design is actually very standard 
excluding the cylinder. This is very standard for that era. And actually, this is a fairly complicated pistol for that era. If you look at French pistols or British pistols, well, depends on the British pistol, but French pistols in other European countries, this is pretty much standard. The loading gate on this is standard. Now, this looks archaic to us. And many, many people will say these Russian guns were just clunky, archaic, very simple. But this was actually fairly high speed for its era especially with this cylinder. That was pretty amazing at the time, but even features we often hear in videos about these guns that are just, they are even sometimes put out as design flaws, like say the extractor where you have to pull it out, rotate it to push cartridges out. Now that's slow to us, but what you have to understand at the time is that was fairly high speed. If you look at the Reich's revolver used by Germans, they didn't even have that. You would carry a wooden dowel rod and punch out the cartridges. This is a fairly standard revolver. It is not archaic for the time it was designed. Now the next mistake people make about this revolver is saying that it is weak. That's actually not true with this cartridge. I believe this myth actually comes from the privy ammunition that people shoot out of this most often because it's the most available. That is a target load. It is extremely weak because all you have to do with it is push a bullet through a piece of paper. Uh, the actual loads for this you get with hand loading or with the original cartridges, which actually seem a little bit too heavy for me. Um, it's about comparable to a 380. Now that might seem a little bit anemic to somebody who's thinking of a 45 or a 9 millimeter, but what you have to understand is at the time, one of the most common calibers to carry for an officer was a 32 ACP, which is even weaker. That's a little too weak for me. This is about a 380, or also comparable to about a 3220, but that's not as common. People might not understand what that is. Uh, but about a 380 is what you're looking at here, which is a perfectly capable self-defense revolver. This is a blastage weapon or a weapon for an officer. It doesn't have to be overly powerful. This did the job just fine, and it was rugged enough to make it through the trenches. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of shooting now. I'm going to test three different ammunition loads. The first is going to be the privy ammo, which is just target ammo and which most people are used to in this revolver because it's the easiest to get your hands on if you're not a hand loader. Now this ammunition is weak. It's very, very weak. It was designed just to put a bullet through paper, as I said before. And when people get the impression of this revolver, and that's the only ammunition they've shot, I can easily see why they wouldn't be very impressed with it. It's also not very accurate in my experience. It's just to allow you to shoot the gun, basically. So let's go ahead and start shooting with it and see how it does. Now, it's a seven-shot revolver, so it kind of feels like you're shooting for an exceptionally long amount of time for some reason. But, as you can see, there's almost no recoil. It's very unimpressive. Um, and it doesn't shoot very well. That gong shot, uh, I was actually aiming for a dot on the left side of the target, and it hit the gong like about six inches over. Um, I think... The problem with this is that the bullets are actually undersized. I haven't quite tested that yet, but that's what I've heard from other people, and it seems to be the case. So, as some people have said, the loading on these is a bit, I don't know, slow, but you simply just push out the cartridges. But that is fairly standard for the time. Uh, that's just fine. As I said, the Reich's revolver was even worse than that. You actually just punched them out with a uh, dowel run. So let's get on to the next ammunition, which will be my reloads. So this is one of my reloads. As you can see, the case doesn't completely cover it because this is actually 3220 brass. That's fine. All that means is you're not going to get the gas seal. Now this is a 100 grain cast bullet over three grains of tight group, which gets you about 900 feet per second. So as I said before, that equals out to about 
a 380 in power. Now these are more powerful than the Privy um, and more accurate obviously, but they're not as powerful as the original loads or at least not as much recoil, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. But these are very fun to shoot and you can get very good accuracy out of them. Now this revolver is double action as well, but I never use it in double action because the trigger pull is just abysmal. But I'll go ahead and demonstrate it for you now. It's actually very difficult to keep it aimed in the right direction. You tend to pull the gun up while you're pulling the trigger in double action. It's meant as a very close range you know, quick shooting uh, technique, I'll say, because this revolver clearly was not meant to be shot like that. It just, it's impossible to be accurate. It's for very quick shooting at close range in an oh shit situation. But otherwise, I highly recommend shooting this in single action. Now, next up is the original ammunition. I wanted to show you the difference between the original ammunition, the Privy, and my reloads just to show you a little bit as you can see this is the original ammunition uh, you can see it just simply tapers up in kind of a crimp with the bullet inside like that my reloads as I said before do not come all the way up uh, but the privy has a different way of going about it they actually just kind of crimp the end there there's no kind of tapering that you get with the original ammo um, they work the same way, uh, the Privy and the original, but I think they kind of cheaped out in the way they went with it, and I don't know if that gets the same gas seal, but what I will say is this original ammo uh, is very hard to get out of the gun when you're reloading, or extracting the ammo, I should say. And I think that has to do with this is a thicker cartridge and when it expands out it kind of binds it against the end of the cylinder preventing you from pushing it out. Anyone who's fired the original ammo says it's extremely hard to extract from the gun and I'll show you that. But I think it actually has to do with the way it's sealing and just how hard it is to break it off the end of the cylinder. So this is the original Russian ammo. Much more recoil, as you can probably see in here. It does not feel weak at all. In fact, it throws this back little hump here right into the uh, web of your hand, and it's kind of painful a little bit. So yeah, there is absolutely nothing weak about this cartridge. Uh, you can definitely feel the power in it. And as I said, the myth probably comes from the ammunition people are shooting, not how the gun actually performed in combat. Uh, but it's a fun gun to shoot and gives you a lot of options when it comes to reloading. I definitely recommend either getting one of these revolvers or taking the revolver you have out of the drawer and actually shooting it. The reloading dies are widely available. It's not hard to reload. Uh, some of the things I'd say watch when you're reloading is first of all slug your bore to make sure you're using the properly sized ammunition. They are not all the same from what I've been reading. I lucked out got one that uses standard 20 or 32 but make sure to slug your bore. Also what you want to watch when you're reloading with 3220 brass is that case is very thin so when you're actually seating the bullet go very slow because you want to avoid crushing that case which will happen to you probably a couple of times before you get the hang of it uh, but other than that it's a very easy cartridge to reload for don't be scared of it it's very simple there's plenty of information out there on how to reload for it take this pistol out and shoot it it's a ton of fun hit some steel with it um, that's about all I have to say on this. Like I said, there's a lot of myths going on about this revolver, 
But in terms of a World War One era revolver uh, that is easy to get your hands on, easy to reload for, and a lot of fun to shoot, uh, this is probably the revolver you're going to go for. So thanks for watching. Have a nice day.